Thank you all for joining us on this really miserable day. Um, my name is Simon Jennard, I'm assistant curator here. It's my pleasure to introduce um, Anna Eti, whose work was standing in front of. Um, so Anna is joining us from Alti Porti de Nudo today. Um, she's a sculptor who works with um, installation and moving image and language. Um, she's uh, shown at the Walking Art Gallery um, on that terrace. And um, also the Adamant Gallery and various galleries around the country. Um, and she was also the McCann House resident in 2020. Um, she was going to say a few words about her work. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you all for coming. Great. I'll just whip off my mask. Um, kia ora koutou. Thank you all for coming out today. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I uh, almost didn't get here. When I arrived last night um, from my flight from Wellington, all the other flights after mine were cancelled, so, you know, good vibes to be in New Plymouth. Um, I just wanted to start out by thanking a few people, so I want to acknowledge the Gavit Brewster, who, like, has supported and enabled me to make this work. Um, I also wanted to uh, thank Megan, who isn't here right now, but she's on her way in the car. Hopefully she'll arrive at some point today. Um, but yeah, it's a real privilege to be in this exhibition, especially including works by Matt Penny, Shona Rapira Davies and Kate Newby, who are artists I really super admire. So yeah, I feel very fortunate to be involved in the show and I'm very pleased that Megan um, invited me to be a part of it. Yeah, so I thought maybe what could be a good way to talk about this work is I'm going to tell you a little bit about the process that went into making it and um, yeah, how it came to be here. So I guess like the very starting point for the work um, I was like looking at these whakapapa trees and I came across this name, um, Hine Tua Hoanga, and she is, um, she's considered to be an atua of sandstone and limestone and material like that. And in my practice in general, I'm really interested in uh, stone and rock as material, geological material, I think is really interesting because it exists sort of in a different time scale to a human being. Um, you know, like these things have been here long before we have and they continue a lot further out. And as well with uh, geological materials, things like that, um, these are often things that are used in sort of early architecture of cities and, and I think it says a lot about our history of place um, yeah, so that, that's part of my interest in the material. Uh, so when I came across um, Hine Tua Hoanga, I kind of googled her, because I was like, who is this? I need to know more. And I came across an article on um, this historic newspaper repository called Papers Past. It's a very amazing resource, heaps of scanned historic newspapers. And in this article, it was from 1908, it's an article from the Grey River Argus, which was a West Coast newspaper. Um, there was a little bit about, about her, about Hini Tua Hoanga, and there were these different names that they used, I guess translations. So the names were um, the Lady of the Rubber, the Girl Whose Back Was a Whetstone, and um, I think the other one was the Maiden Who Stands as Grindstone. And, you know, for someone who's really interested in materiality, I was like, amazing. This is like a very poetic and interesting names. And there's definitely something in there. So I kind of put a pin in that piece of information. I took a screen capture on my computer. And then um, I thought I'll come back to that at another time. Yeah, so when Megan invited me to be in the exhibition, I thought back onto that piece of research I had done and I thought, ah, that's my time. Like, this is the perfect moment to look more into this atua wahine and, um, 
you know, get into some research around her. Uh, yeah, so more about Hinitua Huanga. There are a few different pūrako about her, um, and depending on where you come from, there are different versions of these stories as well. Uh, one incredible story that someone told me is that when Rangi and Papa were separated, then Hinitua Huanga, she was the entity that provided the adzes that were used to cut their, cut their bodies apart, which is like crazy, like what a story. Um, and then another more common story about her has to do with Rata. So um, Rata wanted to chop down a totara tree because he needed to go on a journey. And to go on the journey, he needed to make a waka. But he didn't have uh, the tools that were required to, to do this. So he came to Hinitua Hoanga, who in, uh, depending on who you ask, like for some people, they would say that she was his grandmother. And she told him that he could grind his axe on her back and that uh, by doing that he could sharpen it and that would enable him to have the right tool to chop down the totara tree. Um, yeah, so that's what he did and she enabled him to go on his journey that he needed to go on. Um, and when he sharpened the axe on her spine, the area of her it's like her, her, the vertebra of her spine is what he was like grinding his ads against. Yeah, so this work is kind of about that. Um, when I think about this action of sharpening, it's like about, there's like these sort of different relationships. There's the person who needs to do the sharpening. There's this object that is being sharpened and then there's the surface that's being ground upon and all of this is sort of about relationships and friction and um, I think sort of inherent into this friction is the idea that for the axe to be sharpened some of the material has to be lost so something has to be given and when you sharpen on a stone or something like that the, the surface itself is damaged so both, both things are shaped by their relationship to one another. Um, yeah, and a big part of the project coming here is to do a site visit. So um, we managed to come down a few times, which was really great. And um, on one of those trips, I went to Puki Ariki and I was looking at a historic huanga that they have there in their collection. Um, and I went to the library and I was just sort of researching, thinking, trying to come up with, um, you know, how the project was going to be in the world. And I, anyway, so I'd had like quite an intense day of book reading and I decided it would be quite nice to go for a walk. So I went to, I wanted to go and look at Paritutu. So I went and walked down by the sea towards the port, which was really nice, but also it was kind of really terrible because the weather was quite bad. <laughs> So I had to, I was searching for shelter and I kind of w went down um, the break and sheltered sort of in that area there. And I had brought with me my camera and I was looking at the forms down there, these Akmon forms. And so I was taking a few photos and videos and um, as I was doing that, it kind of struck me that the way they look down there, um, they're sort of stacked on each other, really resembled a spine. And I was like, mm, okay, this can be, I think this could be something helpful for me. And um, yeah, so that's where the forms of the sculpture comes from. They're like references to those. So if you don't know much about Akmons, they're sort of like large concrete cast forms. They're often used on like sea walling and things like that. So formally, they're quite interesting because they're modular. Um, you can kind of arrange them in different ways, like they can fit into each other. Sometimes they'll be uh, in mounds. Um, but uh, I thought also conceptually, they were quite, quite relevant to what I was thinking about because the, the point of them is to absorb energy from, from the ocean 
to absorb the tidal energy and to protect like a man-made structure. So they're kind of really visible, yeah, at this point of friction between sort of man-made architecture and natural forces. And especially at the port, of course, which is, um, you know, a site of industry. The reason that the uh, breakwater is there is to protect anchorage. So th I thought as well there was, um, you know, more friction around this sort of environmental, industrial situation that happens here. Yeah. Uh, and I think I can tell you a bit about the surfaces as well. So, you know, we've talked a lot about the forms, but the surfaces on these are made out of Oamaru stone. Um, and in the South Island, some of the stories there, uh, Oamaru stone is considered to be the bones of Hinitua Huanga. Um, and I do think uh, the surfaces are quite bodily. <laughs> Not very often in my practice do I think about the body um, within the work that I make. I always think about it as, as in how like, you, know, you relate to an exhibition or how you would navigate a space, but it's not often the subject of the work. So it was quite an interesting, uh, challenging <laughs> kind of idea for me to think about. But yeah, and especially because, you know, the story about her is also about her letting her back, you know, be, be used as a tool in that way. So there's different actions taken on the three works. This one is like a slicing, um, and the huanga itself is kind of associated with different movements. So a huanga as in like the sharpening stone or the tool, so you would like pounding, slicing, grinding, these are all kind of associated with that particular implement. Yeah, so this one is slicing. These forms, like these, these marks are kind of referencing these channels that you might sharpen the toki, like the ads head in. Uh, this one, which we can't see the face of right now, this was like quite a brutal one. <laughs> so the actions that I took on that one were really like bashing, um, large chunks of sandstone flying, very sculpture feeling. <laughs> uh, and um, there I also like, if you go to Oamaru, some of the buildings there, they have this particular like rough mm, texture onto the block. So it's, I was trying to replicate some of that as well. And then this last work here, um, this is more of a grinding, grinding form. So the different, the different shapes on that or marks, I would consider those to be like tracings. Uh, so I was replicating some of the mark making that I saw on the huanga from the museum. Um, and for me and in my work, it's quite interesting and special to try and connect with the past and people like past makers. So to replicate, you know, in a small way, some of these shapes that um, ancestors had made was uh, special, like a special way of connecting to, to the past. Um, yeah, I guess so. And so what else can we say? The structures are steel. Oh, at the, the size of the Ackmans is also different. Like if you've been out to the breakwater, uh, in real life, the Ackmans are quite big, but these are human scales, so they're kind of a little bit of a self-portrait in a way. Like when you look at the face, it's kind of like, you know, it's about like this, and it's a bit taller than me, but it's all to human size. Um, yeah, and I guess maybe I'll just talk a little bit about the contents of the vitrine over here as well. Uh, so inside of the vitrine, there are uh, research materials basically. So lots of the things that I've talked about with you all here, um, you know, they're represented in there. So there's a cup, there's an image of the newspaper article that was like the starting point for the project. And then there's some photographic images. Um, you know, there's some of the seawall and there's also some of like the, my body and sand and things like that. 
yeah, there's also some writing in there. So um, part of the process, almost all the time for me, of making, making work for an exhibition would be writing. Because I think that writing is a really good way to kind of hone down ideas that you have. Like you might have noticed, there are lots of different references in this work. So sometimes it all swirls around and you need to kind of um, cast some of those things aside until you can really get to the meat of what it's all about. And I find writing is a really good practice to do that. So yeah, I wrote these sort of three texts. Um, and I guess I hope that the texts, like you can read them and they might um, show some things to you in the sculpture that you might not otherwise have seen or maybe the sculpture will do the same to the writing, you know? Yeah, and I think that that might be all that I have today. Any yeah. questions? Yeah, yeah. No questions necessary, like all good if not. <laughs> I know when you were here and you were making these, yes. it was really exciting. We had Logan Bay and you were actually working on the stone. You hit about five? I had six. Yeah, and so will they continue to be connected with this work in some way, or will you, might you use those in a different mm. way? Oh, that's a great question, Zara. <laughs> um, well, the reason I had six is because I wanted to kind of make, uh, like in the process of making the work, there was only, sometimes you only get to realise things at the very end. So the carving process was definitely that part. And um, I wanted to do six just in case uh, one of them didn't turn out. And I think I did have one that I decided not to use for the show. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I've, I live in um, Otsuporti, Dunedin now, so I'm close to Uamaru and the material seems very relevant to, you know, where I am. So I hope, I hope more work can come from them, although they are very heavy. So uh, as a single person, <laughs> like trying to shift them around, I fear for my uh, physical well-being. <laughs> Like when we brought the stone up in the gallery, we used this gantry, which is like covered by a shield, but yeah, they are um, serious business. <laughs> so you What's that? You didn't have one on your lap when you No, no, I had, to, I had to kind of like, you know, I was like a ghost over them. <laughs> yeah. It's an amazing combination between the spiritual and the mm. sort of technological, industrial, and stone coming from the earth as well. Yeah. Can you pull all those things together? Yeah, well, I think as well, um, I guess maybe for some people they would want to know why, as a, like, a contemporary sculptor, I might want to kind of bring Hine Toa Huanga, who is a traditional figure, into my practice. But I think... Um, First of all, like, I'm really interested in history, but I'm also really interested in like, making new things. Um, I think it's important and exciting to be able to do that. But I also, um, I guess, I was really, I'm really interested in art history as well. And I come from, I like, went to a very traditional art school and I went through a sculpture department there in Christchurch. And like, our art historical education was very like Eurocentric, a lot of American art history and European. And so I guess like for me, I wanted to, well lots of people will think that Marcel Duchamp is like the granddaddy of sculpture, which you know, true, true. <laughs> but I thought it was like empowering for me to think about um, Hini Tua Huanga, like, you know, an ancestor who belongs here who, um, you know, there is this like spiritual relationship that she would be like the person that um, sculpture would come from. So that is part of the, um, yeah, thinking around that as well. Uh, I've noticed you work in um, very permanent materials. Yeah. <laughs> in other works as well. Do you also, do you use um, you know, more ephemeral materials that um, do you draw as well? 
Well, I love drawing. I think it's such a nice process. Um, and I did heaps and heaps of drawing when I was at art school. But I think that these days, I kind of consider like the writing to be a drawing process. Because I think drawing is like a way to think about things and like process ideas. And that's kind of what I do with the writing, which I think can be quite ephemeral as well. Um, yeah. I mean, and sometimes I make video. I guess like in my practice, I do like, three main things, it's like sculpture, like big, serious, difficult to store, <laughs> video, that's on a USB, that's in the cloud, do you know what I mean? <laughs> no, it's my pleasure. I do like, have to say though, when I like look at Shona's preparatory drawings for her work, which are downstairs, they are incredible to me, like, and I think that they are supposed to be preparatory, but they're like amazing works in themselves, so. Maybe I should try and get back into the practice of drawing. Oh, sorry, yes. Did you construct the structures themselves? You know, like, did you do all the welding? No, so um, I, I can weld, but I'm not that good at it. Uh, so for, to, to make the work, um, we worked with a company in Wellington, which is where I was living at the time, Human Dynamo. And they did, they did all the welding and stuff for me, um, which is good, so it's like all nice and straight. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, not it's not nice the, welding. Yeah, not that I'm any time being spurred on welding. No. But it's not pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And then I understand the reason why you tip them over the way that you have, mm. but I'm not quite sure why these two are straight and that one's angled. It must be deliberate. Yeah, it's just sort of, uh, I guess, you know, we were talking about movement and stuff like that on the works. And I, the way that we arranged them in the gallery, I wanted to think about it like the spine so that the roof would be like the top of the back and we would be inside and this could be like, I guess, like a partial part of the spine. But you know, in the story when, um, and this is not really, when people talk about that story about Rata and um, Hini Tua Hoanga, they don't often talk about her very much. They're more focused on this heroic journey. But I did read one kind of reflection on it where they were talking about like the pain that she must have felt or like, you know, but, and it was her offering that she gave to him that he could do that. But um, I mean, formally it's quite nice, but I guess like maybe it's like a bit broken, spiny, kind of thing as well, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> Great. Yeah, yeah. Cheers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to thank you, Anna. I'll like put my mask back on. All the way up here oh, my pleasure. Talk with everyone and share all that background about your work and for being around today as well. Um, just before I do finally thank Anna, just want to say also Megan Tamati Cornell that Anna mentioned, the curator, who's driving up from Wellington. We'll be here about four o'clock and we'll give a uh, talk about Kate Newby's work and also we'll be with Shona Rapira Davies downstairs on the wall where Shona's work is and they'll be talking together about Shona's work, um, which is fantastic. It's the first talk that Shona's given about the work. Mm. Um, and Elaine just wanted me also to remind people or let you know that we've got some flyers down at the front desk about another extended part of the Swallowing Geography exhibition, which are tours of the land here around Kupiariki by Damon Retai, who's known to Fiti. And there's three of those, the first one's starting on Monday morning at 8.45. So they all take place at 8.45, morning tours, and um, there's another, there's two in November and one in February as well. So if you're interested, pick up some information downstairs. But thank you all for coming. And again, thanks, Anna, so much for your great talk. Oh, thank you. <laughs>